Welcome to The Vault, a mini-series within the tales of the lost universe that ventures into secrets hidden inside the archives of the Library of Congress. In this next batch of episodes, we will be exploring the many cancelled American anime adaptations created by Renaissance Atlantic and Bandai Entertainment, rejected pilots and TV treatments forever lost in the archives. Until now, each new episode covers a new discovery. What piece of lost media might turn up next? Follow us as we dive into the depths of the vault. Tonight's episode is a bit of a screamer. The mecha genre has been a popular mainstay in Japanese media for many years. In the 1930s, the first robotic character was created, and 20 years later, two iconic characters known as Astro Boy and Tetsujin 20 Go emerged, further defining the genre. While the former became a blueprint for super robots of the android and cyberpunk genre, the latter would cement a long-standing tradition of mecha anime. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, mechas are defined as giant, powerful robots, piloted by mere humans. Eventually, the concept of a human-operated mecha was pushed a step further with the introduction of Mazinger Z in the 1970s, developed by Japanese comic artist Go Nagai. During this same decade, a groundbreaking franchise emerged and became one of the most influential series that would go on to inspire numerous mecha space dramas that followed it. Mobile Super Gundam. The epic space drama was set in a futuristic world where an Earth-based federation is locked in a war with the separatist group, relying on the human-piloted RX-78 Gundam as its primary weapon. The Gundam universe quickly became one of the most influential titles in the history of anime and manga, demonstrating that it was possible to incorporate the genre into a vast, reflective world akin to other prominent and wildly successful sci-fi genres. The Gundam universe has since expanded into multiple iterations and timelines, accompanied by a plethora of merchandise, with their model kits growing to a level of popularity that's managed to carve out a subculture of its own. Though it took some time to catch on internationally, the Gundam craze subsequently gained favorable praise in the West after the 2000 release of Mobile Suit Gundam Wing. While the series fared modestly well in Japan, it found greater success in the United States and popularized the Gundam franchise in the West. However, due to the increased popularity of the series and its success in North America, preceding series like G Gundam would go on to also receiving their own English localizations through Bandai Entertainment in the early 2000s. Having been produced by Sunrise, an official animation studio operating under the Bandai umbrella, and with their Gunpla being a hot item in the toy market, it would come as no surprise that the series held a great deal of potential at having its own American spin-off in the eyes of North American executives and investors. Before the dub of Mobile Suit Gundam Wing could plant its roots into American soil, executives were trying to figure out the best way to transform the anime in a way that could best grab the attention of young American audiences. That's where the companies Renaissance Atlantic and Bandai America come into play. As part of their initiative to Americanizing Japanese properties, under the guidance of Renaissance Atlantic CEO Frank Ward, several concepts had been drafted up in the form of TV treatments to adapt the franchise into new live-action hybrids and animated series based on elements not just cherry-picked from previous Gundam iterations, but also elements from existing popular mecha franchises. In today's video, we'll be covering a handful of Gundam spin-off attempts that had been tucked away in the Library of Congress, including two TV treatments and a pilot trailer. Firstly, I wanted to briefly discuss two of the pilot treatments that have been submitted to the archives by Frank Ward himself. Colony 4GV9, submitted on March 26th of 1996, and a treatment known as 4776, submitted April 28th in 1999. Both treatments are heavily inspired by different elements of the Gundam franchise, but also contain a handful of their own unique 
unique differences. Though they inherit mecha elements, we can also spot much heavier sci-fi elements than previous incarnations of Gundam, where the majority of the Gundam installments take place during a space war between human colonies, the two treatments submitted by Frank incorporate aliens of another life form. Both treatments also touch on themes of environmentalism, which was most likely a choice added to adhere to the Children's Television Act of 1991. Many cartoons of that time had a heavy moral lesson or environmentalist motif, as it was part of a broadcast standard for children's programming to contain a certain amount of content that could quote-unquote serve the educational needs of children. We can actually see this implemented in quite a few concepts created by Renaissance Atlantic, like in the Guardians of the Cosmos pilot. With this in mind, it would make sense as to why both TV treatments veer off of the action-heavy space war elements. For the crowd of more dedicated Mobile Suit Gundam fans, I'm very eager to see what similarities you're able to spot between these treatments to the elements within the Gundam universe. So let's dive into these treatments one by one, starting with the TV treatment for Colony 4GV9. The story. Concealed deep in the dense and unworldly jungle lies an advanced civilization from the distant planet located in the fourth galaxy, Vector 9, 4GVN. The Elions came to Earth many years ago, nearly escaping their home planet before it became hopelessly uninhabitable. They colonized Earth and named their new home Colony 4GV9. The original species had come on a kind of intergalactic Noah's Ark, carrying samples of all the species and plants from home, and all they needed to replicate their former world, which was 9,000 years more advanced than ours, except a couple of things went wrong. First, their animals accidentally mingled with certain Earth animals, producing creatures never before seen, certainly not on TV or in the movies. Some of these new breeds were quite friendly and benign, but others were more fierce beyond imagination and a constant threat to life on the colony. Next, to make matters worse, some of their plants cross-fertilized with native plants. Now, among other oddities, they have ivy that behave like a boa constrictor. Concerned about the future contamination, the Elions have decided to seal themselves off from the rest of Earth. Mind you, they had no fear of us. On the contrary, we were, for them, much the same as a wildlife park would be for us. Within Colony 4 GV9, they have constructed an array of buildings, machines, and defensive weapons using, to us, unimaginable biomechanics and a kind of digital genetic code that permits them to grow physical objects. Being far more advanced than us in science, technology, Technology, they quite easily created a sort of stealth cover for their jungle colony. By controlling the magnetic and telepathic field, and by their ability to bend time, they erected a virtually impenetrable shield around their colony. On those rare occasions when, for instance, a military plane got too close, they were easily able to erase the pilot's memory without destroying him or his aircraft. Of course, all this time they had been able to observe us through an immensely powerful compact optics cyber system. We are, in a way, their entertainment. And the more they watched us, the less interested they are in getting to know us better. So, despite our technical advances, we have never discovered them. Until now. Two 20-something hitchhikers accidentally cracked the shield and stumbled into the fearsome jungle. This unlikely pair will be the Link. The adventures begin in this hidden civilization that exists right here on Earth. In this unimaginable jungle full of hideous creatures, a superior race of people use their advanced technology and futuristic science to live in their new world. For their entertainment, there's us, the Elions. They are far more advanced than we, yet they are very human in appearance. No pointy ears, above all, no Leica suits, no Star Trek costumes. Although not steroid ingested, they are incredibly strong with remarkable physical skills and even more astonishing mental and scientific powers. The Elions will be masked, and in later episodes we'll find out what is underneath the masks. Among other skills, they can hypnotize and rearrange memories, rearrange molecular structure, change appearances, perform immense feats of strength, speed, agility, and endurance, solve any number of scientific problems that we on Earth struggle with, do phenomenal mental tricks of memory and calculations, remotely control their machines and weapons, telepathically communicate, be invulnerable to any of our standard weaponry. They are a true super race, yet there are some bad apples. Whereas the good guys on Colony 4GV9 want to avoid contact with us humans, 
content to observe us as a sort of zoo, the bad guys want to have some fun by wrecking havoc, taunting, teasing, and tricking us. Inevitably, the good guys end up helping us against their baser brethren. The conflicts. There is a conflict in the colony between the Elions and the creatures of the jungle. There is also conflict inside the colony between the bad guys who want to get out of the colony and disrupt human life, and the good guys who want to stop them. This eventually leads to the next step with the good guys helping humans resolve their conflicts. In the future, the Elions may become more and more drawn into human conflicts. For them, it's easy to solve problems that are a big issue to us. The jungle. The creatures. The jungle is definitely not Disney and definitely a powerful story element. The Elions have partially recreated the jungles of their native planet, the jungle that provides much of their life source. Absolutely nothing in their jungle resembles our Earth jungle. Some of the plants and trees are alive and a few are dangerous. The creatures are equally unique and unearthly. Snakes of incredible length with tentacles and the ability to camouflage themselves are just one of the problems. Ants the size of cocker spaniels are another. Consequently, many in the colony live in elevated houses, high-tech tree houses. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these rights, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute a new form of government. Declaration of Independence? Yes. 1776? No. 4776! 3,000 years later. But the citizens of Earth have chosen these historic words to mark their own revolt from the tyranny of the Jovian Empire. By the year 4776, Earth has become a mere colony of the Jovian Empire for nearly a century. The Jovians are a highly advanced life form, centered millions of light years from our galaxy, who have been monitoring our development since they first detected molecular life forms in Earth's primal swamps. They have watched us evolve from primitives through innumerable wars, plagues, miraculous art, hideous diseases, countless evils, yet many measures of goodness, and a relentless, restless talent for scientific discovery. Finally, by the 23rd century, we have begun to explore space beyond our galaxy. Intergalactic travel was becoming a routine, and the science of terraforming, making the uninhibitable inhibitable, quite advanced. Humans had a number of large space stations and various orbits, as well as scientific outposts on Mars and Venus. Earth itself had changed radically to support the now huge population. An enormous tube-shaped structure completely encircled the planet, held in place by shafts anchored to Earth's core. Thus, millions of Earth citizens were able to live and work in space. These developments had begun to worry the Jovians. They concluded that humankind's scientific capabilities far exceeded our wisdom and good sense. Although still nowhere near the Jovian levels of development, we had become a potential threat. Of course, humans had long been arguing about whether there was any other life in the universe. Countless books and films had dealt with alien life and the mysteries beyond our skies. But there had never been proof. Sure, there had been signs from time to time in the form of indecipherable radio signals, the sudden disappearance of our space exploration vehicles, and so on, but no proof. Until one day, with absolutely no warning, there they were. Suddenly and simultaneously, a commanding voice was heard, and the message repeated for hours on every VCI, a visual computer interface, replacing TVs by the 22nd century on the planet. The message? Come in peace. You cannot resist. We are a much older life form and far more advanced. We ask only for your calm cooperation. Further instructions will follow. In the following days, Earth was given again via VCI demonstrations of Jovian might, of Jovian science, and even glimpses of the Jovian Empire's home planet, though without visible life yet. So the takeover of Earth was bloodless. The first appearance of actual Jovian soldiers was a sensation. After centuries of speculation about what aliens would look like, it was still a shock. Over 100,000 Earth years older than us, the Jovians are basically three foot high brains. 
They look like little upright snails. Robots from the average everyday get around variety to the gigantic space machines are their army and legs. Although the subjugation was benign enough, it gradually dawned on Earth's people that they no longer commanded their own destiny. From the outset, further space exploration was forbidden. Also, all work on weapons and research was banned. No need, said the Jovian Empire. We shall provide for you. As time wore on, Earth's grievances multiplied. Among the injustices and humiliations, there was no longer private property. All belonged to the Jovian Empire. All laws were Jovian. All Earth's democratic institutions were suspended. Humans no longer decided for themselves. The Jovian surveillance systems were intrusive. Nothing takes place without them knowing. After decades of this, Earth has had enough. They declare independence, although they know full well that the Jovian Empire will oppose them vigorously. Yet they never imagine that there will actually be war over the matter. They could hardly be more wrong. Hence, the vastly outnumbered and outgunned revolutionary forces of Earth must fight for their freedom. A relative handful of brave freedom fighters must stave off wave after wave of attacks by far superior forces. They, like the ancient battle for Britain way back in 1940, buy time until their own scientists and engineers develop sufficient weapons. At first, the Jovians fail to take Earth's patriots seriously. After all, how can this ragtag bunch with outmoded weapons and vehicles possibly challenge Jovian power? But in spite of the odds, bravery and ingenuity buys the Earth precious time to catch up. It's David versus Goliath. It's a handful of militiamen at Lexington Concord. It's the RAF versus unbeatable Luftwaffe. Most of the battle actions take place in space. From time to time, however, we will visit the Jovian Empire, sometimes on espionage missions, or for fruitless peace negotiations, etc. The stars of the show are the fantastic weaponry on both sides and the ensuing battles. The time period, 4776, gives us an opportunity during the lulls of the fighting to show what people and life many be like almost 3,000 years from now. For instance, thoughts can be transmitted from one brain to another. This can get awkward, needless to say. People can be transported as molecular waves, allowing them to pop up in odd places at odd times, although there are also defenses against this. Some of our 1999 games have survived, but with radical changes. A version of football is played in a weightless cylinder, for example. The buildings people live in, their everyday commuting vehicles, etc., will be unlike anything we know now. So the whole look of the show beyond the battles and wars will be quite unique. But given our need to hold the interest of younger viewers, 4 to 7, we will not delve too deeply into science fiction. The heroes for the Earth's Patriots are three daring young pilots. Pepper, who is the comedian of the trio, is seldom serious. And in battle, his commentary is non-stop. He likes to poke fun at. Duke, who is full of himself, cocky, confident, with movie star looks. He likes to put Pepper down. They tend to squabble, and peace is restored by Joe, the calm, cool, collected, solid astronaut type, who clearly is the leader of the pack and Selena, an absolutely brilliant and absolutely beautiful young lady who is the chief scientific officer of the revolutionary forces. Duke, who she can't stand, is always trying to woo her, as is Pepper, whom she likes but only as a little brother. Joe, meanwhile, is who she really wants, but he is too absorbed in duty to notice. So these are the principal heroes and they are supported by General Montana, a veritable father figure, firm when need be, supportive when it is called for, visionary, kind, understanding, and wildly popular with the Patriots. On the Jovian Empire side, we'll have Emperor Schicklegruber. Schicklegruber? Oh, f you. Yo, uh, Ray, just so you know, Schicklegruber was Hitler's original name. I, I shit you not. Hitler... His his original name was Adolf Schickelgruber. That's a that's a not, that's a Hitler joke. <laughs> yeah, he had a name change. Uh, look it up if you if you're putting this in the video. That's pretty fucking funny. A thoroughly unlikable, unstable, neurotic character who can't imagine why those ingrates on Earth want freedom. Freedom, he sneers. I made them. 
and I'll break them. General June, who has some considerable sympathy for the freedom fighters, but he is a loyal Jovian soldier who tries to carry out the Emperor's orders despite not always agreeing. The rest of the Jovian Empire side will be fairly faceless characters since they always lose in the end. As I mentioned earlier, in addition to the two TV treatments that had been sitting in the archives, there was also a submitted promo trailer simply known as Revolution. The trailer seems to be a more fully realized live-action spin-off and was submitted to the Library of Congress in 1995. Since I had received the shared file through the Library of Congress's Moving Picture Archives and not through the Copyright Office, the file hadn't included any sort of context or summary, like we'd often find in the description of contents of a physical copy. At first, I was sure I didn't need it, but I soon found out that the secondary file I had put an inquiry in for, containing the six-page promo script submitted that same year, had somehow gone missing within the archives, leaving me with nothing but a trailer, scratching my head with heaps of unanswered questions. All that was really clear to me was that this trailer was submitted in 1995, years before Colony 4GV9 and 4776, making this the first of all the Gundam spin-offs that Renaissance Atlantic had worked on. No doubt the very same project that Ellen Aronson was most likely speaking about when she had recalled her early time working with the company. Analyzing the clip alone, we see it set in a mixed media world of 3D space environments and live action humans. The narrator outlines a war between the colonies that have left Earth and the current Earth inhabitants. The colonies wish to return to Earth, but the Earth inhabitants decline, leading to a war which the narrator describes as a battle of brother against brother. A Gundam enters the frame and on the opposing side another mech emerges. The Gundams collide and the trailer ends. It's unclear as to what sort of story had been planned for these characters that appeared in the trailer, but with the little evidence I had, I figured it would still be worth it to investigate things further. From what I was able to gather, I managed to conclude that the Soldier of the Earth was portrayed by 80s and 90s male fashion model Glenn Kaufman. However, the second soldier for the side of the space colony, I was sadly unable to identify. It's pretty bizarre to think that Gundam Wing, one of the most influential mech animes in North America, was almost completely sidelined for a string of countless American adaptations. Had Gundam been turned into a former shell of itself, I wonder what sort of impact that would have had on the future of Gunpla anime in America, and what sort of science fiction media inspired by it would have ceased to exist in the way we know it today. Tonight, I'd like to display this finding in all its glory. Perhaps someone in the audience will be able to decipher the remaining mysteries hidden within this bizarre trailer. A separate upload of the pilot trailer will be posted a day after the premiere of this video. But until then, this is the pilot trailer for the 1995 American Gundam adaptation known as Revolution. For countless ages of man, Earth had been the source of all life. But by the 22nd century, war, pollution, and overpopulation had taken their toll. The planet was on the verge of death. The Unity Project was a desperate attempt to save the Earth. Billions of people were forced to move into five unities, enormous space stations designed to preserve different aspects of the planet. Energy manufacturing, agriculture, genetics, and a massive data complex to guide the noble experiment. While a small fraction of mankind remained on Earth as caretakers of the planet, for a hundred years the Unity Project was a success and the planet began to heal. But the Unities grew discontented. Humans forced to live their entire lives in space demanded to return home, whether the planet was ready or not. Conflict was inevitable. The Earth became a fortress to keep them out. A charismatic leader emerged from space. The Earth is our birthright. It will be denied to us no longer. A young soldier arose from Earth. The Earth needs time to heal and I'll defend it with my life, if I must. 
they will fight using the most advanced technology available in weapons unlike any seen before. Brother against brother, the battle for the future of Earth begins. Thank you for dining with us. There's more where that came from. What lost media do you think will be shown from the vault next? If you would like to support this little series, don't forget to like and subscribe. Ta-ta for now.